Okay, moving along, Rebecca, I think you're gonna take over from here. I am. Hello, and thank you all for joining us. I am Rebecca Rotundo. I'm the Associate Director for Learning Design here at CEI. And I have the great pleasure of facilitating the next portion of our day. So we have um, the honor of having a couple of faculty from UB who volunteered to speak with us about their experiences meeting the challenges that that the unique challenges that they faced um, after the big push. Um, so they come from different worlds and they um, have different unique situations and they, they met their challenges wonderfully. Um, so first we will speak with Dr. Uh, Kristen Pointer. She's the assistant professor for the Department of Geology and the Renew Institute. And she's gonna talk with us about um, her experience in teaching across course levels online. So the differences, the commonalities and differences between teaching a hundred level course versus a 400 or 500 level course. And then we're going to hear from Dr. Michael Kesey. He's a humanities liaison librarian um, here at UB. And he's going to talk about the unique challenges of teaching one of the oldest and traditional, most traditional topics, ancient grief, and how you do that online and how he did it very successfully. So just so you know how we're gonna do this, um, each presentation is gonna be about 15 or 20 minutes. And then we're gonna have a few minutes for um, questions and conversation. So we're gonna do the same sort of process if you could mute and then ask questions in the chat and then I'll help facilitate that conversation when the presentation is over. All right, so we're gonna begin with uh, Dr. Kristen Poynar who should be able to share her screen. Yeah, um, I believe I am able to share my screen. Um, so here we go. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Kristen Poynar and I am an assistant professor in the geology department. And I am qualified to talk about my own experiences. Uh, so that's what I'm here to do today. Um, so I really appreciate that the theme of this is lessons learned. Uh, because uh, unlike Flower, who we just had the wonderful experience uh, of learning from, um, I am not an expert teacher, um, but I'm a scientist so I can make observations and I can communicate them to other scientists. So <laughs> that's my plan for today. Um, I taught a 100 level course in the spring and I taught a 500, a mixed 400, 500 level course in the fall. So hence my title, 100, 400, 500, I like numbers. Um, and you know, the students in introductory courses and advanced courses differ in their maturity, their competence and their approaches related to coursework. Um, but I did find of course that there are universalities across our UB student population. Um, so, I'm going to share experiences from, from both courses. Um, the introductory course that I taught in the spring is Geology 102, uh, Introduction to Climate Change. It's 385 students. Um, and as everyone knows, we abruptly went online mid-semester. Um, all levels of students take this class. So about two thirds are freshmen or sophomores, about one third are upperclassmen or non-degree students, students of other types. Strangely enough, the gender was not 50-50, uh, which I was surprised to discover when I pulled these statistics. Uh, apparently, I have significantly more men in the class uh, than women. Uh, so I kind of wonder if something's wrong with these statistics, because I honestly never noticed that before. <laughs> so always good to preface your talk with, there might be something wrong with my data. Uh, uh, and, and finally, um, the racial composition of this course is fairly diverse and, and I think rather representative of the UB population at large. Um, students generally enroll in this course to fulfill the scientific literacy and inquiry requirement. Uh, and they choose this course in particular to do that uh, because many of them are interested uh, in climate change and or concerned about climate change. Um, so really a mix of motivations uh, in here. And my fall class uh, was geology 427 slash 527, statistics and modeling in geology. Uh, so this is a mixed upper level undergrad and graduate student class. 
uh, and it says these students all in the same room um, and they're de generally doing the same assignments. Um, the students are mostly master's students uh, with PhD students and junior or senior undergrads in there as well. Uh, the gender is, a, is closer to parity than in my intro class uh, and that reflects the graduate composition of my geology department. Um, but the race is quite homogeneous and not diverse. And, and this is a well-known problem in geology at UB and in geology nationwide uh, that we're working to address. Um, but regardless of those, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, diversity issues, um, I'm here today to present some of the lessons that I learned in each course about the attitudes of UB students um, towards things like course format, how they engaged in the classes, how they did independent work and collaborative work over the course of the semester, um, academic integrity. Um, and I think that some aspects of all these things differed in remote learning environments versus traditional in-person environments, as well as across the course level. Um, and as I mentioned, um, I'm not speaking as any sort of pedagogical expert, but merely as your average instructor uh, who has learned lessons and I'm, I'm willing to share. So for each topic, I've organized my thinking about the themes into two questions. Um, what did the students prefer and what enabled student success? And I think they're not always all that related. Um, so for instance, starting off for course fair format, um, how did the students prefer to encounter the new ideas and what strategies were actually successful um, for student learning? Um, and for course format, for me, this means the schedule on the syllabus and how I map out the course on UB Learns. Um, I try to achieve all of this planning in full in the prep week before classes, so this week, because the students want predictability and because I personally generally benefit greatly from a skeleton of the course that I can stick to later. So um, to the extent possible, um, I even try to plan out the learning goals for each week, um, but uh, <laughs> by, by week three, when that's fallen out of my capability, um, and I planned them the night before, uh, I discovered in my first year of teaching uh, and with the help of these academies uh, that we have here at UB um, to prominently display the learning goals wherever possible, whenever possible, as many times as possible so that the students can't miss them. Um, I also find that starting the lecture on time uh, is a key for me because I tend to teach slow in person. Um, maybe I'm a slow speaking person or maybe I reiterate my ideas a few too many times, um, but I teach slow in person and I've taught even slower online. Um, and so spending the first two to three minutes on Zoom waiting for everyone to get in and maybe their audio isn't working, um, it doesn't serve me. Uh, and furthermore, it removes the motivation for students to show up a minute or two early or, or on time. And, and so if you don't start the lecture on time, I find that I get a sad feedback and it just gets later and later all semester. Um, yeah, so starting and ending the lecture on time is, is key. Um, and finally, I've been the most happy when I have a well-organized course on UB Learns. Um, so, uh, I use the sidebar a lot, and I think the sidebar is something that uh, helps uh, the students always be uh, within one click of where they want to go. Uh, and this helps students who, you know, a lot of them are new to UB, like especially uh, we have first year master's students, uh, and so they haven't used uh, UB Learns. Um, and I need to be better about saying Blackboard instead of UB Learn. So uh, at UB we use we use Blackboard, but it's got sort of you know a vernier on it, and we call it UB Learns. Uh, but all it is is Blackboard. Um, and you know there's a little bit of a learning curve um, as a student user of Blackboard. Um, so here's my Blackboard landing page for my upper level geology course. The course format is moderately complex uh, with lecture and lab. Um, and within those are many types of assignments. So there's daily minute papers for immediate self-review after lecture. Let me blow this up for you actually. Um, homework, labs that have two parts, you have to write the code and you have to do a write-up. Um, there's a midterm project, so, so lots of things. 
And I try to organize all of these things into the sidebar uh, so that students are never more than a click away from what they're seeking. Uh, and, and they liked this. Um, about a third of my students were, viewed, were new to UB this semester, um, so this ameliorated the learning curve for them at least a little bit. Uh, so next, uh, in-class engagement. Um, and again, I'm motivated to think about what students wanted, in, uh, wanted their experience to look like um, and the independent dimension of what actually helped their learning as well as what was feasible in 2020. So the delivery of content during our meeting time was entirely dictated by logistics, the class size and the quality of internet access that the student body had. Uh, so Geology 102, which had hundreds of students with homes all over the state and were, you know, were traveling there in mid-March, don't know what the internet is like. Um, this went straight on to Panopto. I recorded the lectures ahead of time and posted them the morning of class, and then the students had at least two days to watch their lecture and, and react to it with questions. Whereas Geology 427, the upper level class, uh, had 12 students, and by fall 2020, everyone in this class had at least partial on-campus privileges. So we were able to do fall semester live on Zoom. I, I did use the record function on our Zoom meetings um, and spent some time editing the lectures afterwards to improve their quality. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but um, student use of the recorded lectures was on one hand, fairly low because most of the lectures were watched again by only one or two students and the other 10 just never interacted with the lectures once they had seen them live. But on the other hand, it was the same few students who were always going back and re-watching the lecture. Uh, so there was clear utility for having the recorded lecture available on Panopto for those students. Um, so for my large class, um, I have good Panopto statistics uh, for my 385 student class. Um, and so this histogram shows what fraction of lectures were watched by all 370 students who finished the course in May. So I started with 385, but then some of them withdrew. So I ended with 367. Um, and Panopto even reports back to you what fraction of each video was watched. So for instance, if a student watched the first 80% of a lecture and then quit, and they did that for every lecture that they watched, which say that was 80% of the available lectures, um, then they would show up on this histogram in the 64% bid, 80% of 80%. Uh, so these data, um, aside from not watching any lectures, uh, which um, you can see there was a lot, um, other than that, we had a pretty uniform distribution of how much watching of lectures the student did. So, you know, you're equally likely to watch 30% as, you know, some students were watching 90%. Um, so in terms of how did the students prefer to get the material, well, it seems pretty variable from student to student. Um, so now we can ask the question of how well watching the Panopto lectures actually serve the students. So my second question about uh, moving beyond their preference and into the utility that the course material provided. Um, so the scatter plot uh, shows you um, the, uh, the percentage of Panopto lectures that they watch, the histogram that we just saw, and then the course outcome. Um, so I guess this is what this is really showing is the, the correlation between lecture viewership and course performance, uh, because we don't really know the causation. Uh, for instance, the same causation, like maybe of being a good student in general, could cause you to do well in the course, and it could also drive you to watch more videos. Um, so there's a clear correlation, right? These data have sort of an upward trend. Um, the Pearson's uh, correlation coefficient is 0.42. Uh, and, but there's wide scatter, right? And especially at the non-watching segment of the population. So if you watch no videos at all, you might get uh, any grade at all in the course um, it, from D, C, uh, B, or even F. And, you know, actually when I zoomed in here, I found that nobody who, nobody got an A who didn't watch any videos. Um, 
so if you want to improve your grade in the course, um, you simply watch more videos, right? There's a positive slope on this line. Um, in fact, but, but it wasn't that strong of a relationship. If you wanted to improve your course grade by a letter, so 10 percentage points, you needed to increase your, uh, your viewership by 50% of the lectures. So you needed to watch um, 13 additional lectures out of the 28, uh, and that would be enough to raise your grade by one letter grade. Uh, so the correlation is not that strong. In my upper level class, we had instruction on Zoom. Uh, the students' attendance and engagement were very reliable. And I think this stemmed at least in part from their desire for a normal experience, a, a normal student cohort where they all would get to know each other and interact a lot in class and lab and extracurricularly, uh, well, that wasn't really happening this semester. So, but the students were still motivated um, to create and take advantage of those opportunities. Um, so I used my course to help with that, uh, with lots of breakout rooms, with formative exercises and low stakes practice. You know, I wanted them to talk to each other and build the relationships that they craved. And I wanted a lot of that talking to be about statistics and modeling and geology. Um, so thank you, Zoom breakout rooms, for enabling that um, a little bit. Um, so next, um, independent work. How do the students prefer to learn on their own time? Uh, what assessment modes were successful? Um, course evaluations are really good for this, of course, because the students tell you what they liked. Um, but the course evaluations are anonymous, so you can't go and correlate them to how well they did in the course but there's still, still value in the preferences that the students report. Um, so for Challenge 102, there are so many students that every aspect of the course was popular as well as unpopular. And, and this was not unique for 2020. I see this each and every year um, that, uh, that some students don't like the reading quizzes and some students say those reading quizzes really helped me and same with uh, the questions embedded in lecture and same with the homework and we sort of follow this arc for each of the three units and then they all come to the midterm uh, and then the course objectives are met by these this sort of uh, three assessment cycle capped by a midterm. Um, so each year I see this, that uh, each aspect is popular and unpopular, and, and each year I decide that, yes, the, the multiple assessment approach serves everyone, uh, and I'll keep it. Um, and I didn't notice much difference of opinion um, between this semester and other semesters um, on this format. Um, and as I said, I can't correlate what students liked to their course grade um, but I can see how their performance on each assessment type correlated with their final grade. Um, so everything, so there's uh, four, the four assessments from the previous slide um, here and their correlation with their final grade. So midterms, reading quizzes, homework scores, uh, and the in-class lecture uh, questions, which I did on Top Hat last semester. Um, so everything had high correlation, correlation coefficients of 0.85 and above. Um, and if you recall, the panopto watchership, um, the correlation co coefficient was 0.42, uh, so less than half of the correlation with these actual graded assessments. Um, all four of these course aspects were graded, whereas watching a panopto lecture didn't earn the student any course points. And Flower was just talking about this, about you know the philosophy of of grading um, uh, students engage when they earn points. Um, and, you know, I didn't control for that uh, in these correlation graphs, um, although I could have, like, of course, the midterm score is highly correlated to their course grade because the midterm score is in the course grade. Uh, so I didn't control for that, but I should have. But anyway, of the correlation for the uncredited panopto watching was so different from the graded parts of the courses that it begs thinking about. Um, if I'm an optimist, we could say that the more highly correlated activities are active and students have to answer questions and stretch their thinking. Whereas watching a Panopto video is totally passive. So you might say that students learn uh, when they're being actively engaged. Uh, but if you're a pessimist, you might say that uh, students engage primarily when there are points attached. Uh, so I found that interesting. We can move on to collaborative work. Um, 
So uh, how did students prefer to learn with each other? Um, and which, in which ways were, what were the outcomes? Um, you know, in, in, in person, uh, one of the highlights of the semester is a midterm research poster fair. You can see evidence that these are the before times. We're all crowded together in a highway and there's no masks in sight. Um, so this was 2019, this did not happen this year. Um, but I really like it. Um, students use an entire one week of class um, to design their own research projects uh, based on the labs that we've done. Uh, they put it onto nine PowerPoint slides. I have the department uh, printed out and we tape it up as a, as a poster. Um, then we use one class period as a department research poster fair with peer grading uh, so that everyone always has an audience with their poster because their peers are grading them. Um, students love this. I love this day, the department likes it, um, and the students sometimes even invite their roommates or their partners uh, to their presentation. So it's pretty cool to see the pride they have in their work. Well, it's 2020 and this wasn't possible. So in what other ways could I facilitate collaboration and knowledge sharing like this? Um, I tried collaborative homework. And in fact, I was inspired by the course building academy that I took here um, at the Center for Educational Innovation last August, uh, which Michelle ably steered me uh, through building my online course. Um, and Michelle introduced me to the UB Learns Wiki and the, UB, and the Blackboard groups functions. Um, so every two weeks I created random groups of three students and set them loose uh, to address the homework assignments as a group and we graded them collectively as a group, uh, but they could work on it, you know, in whatever structure they saw fit. Um, but unfortunately, these were unpopular. Students didn't like the wiki editor. Um, they were frustrated with free writers uh, who would engage minimally, um, etc. But thankfully, this was easy to adjust. I just gave them a survey. Um, they responded with whether they liked group work and wanted to continue it or do the homeworks by themselves. And I just put the groups who I just put the students who wanted to work alone um, in, a, in a group of one. And that was easy to do on Blackboard. Um, you know, in my large intro class, it was harder to discern their attitudes towards group work. Um, this might be because of the large numbers and the less contact involved with the asynchronous format, um, or also because the group work assignments were very low stakes. Uh, it was either, did you complete them, then you get the points, or did you not complete them, no points. Um, so they could do these worksheets, which are on top hat, um, in a small group formed however they want. Um, so I gave them the freedom to work with their own methods of connection, like FaceTime, and that seemed to be popular. Um, I also offered a Zoom room to connect anyone to their classmates. So maybe you hadn't taken the class uh, with your roommate or your friends and you didn't have a group of your own. Um, so you could show up to this Zoom room and be put into a group. Um, but this was not very popular. Um, fewer than eight students out of 380 some uh, would show up. Um, but these were a distinct population. These were primarily adult learners. Um, so at least this Zoom room uh, served this population and brought them together. Um, okay, finally, um, academic integrity. Um, and gosh, this is, um, this is a big one. Um, we know that students are sometimes tempted to take shortcuts. Um, and did the remote format increase this temptation or introduce any new challenges? Um, and of, cor of course it did, it did. Um, how did this affect the students if they were caught? Um, so for my introductory course, which went online in mid-semester, um, I chose to do exams on the honor system. I couldn't ethically use Respondus, not least because the students hadn't signed up for the class uh, with any inkling that Respondus might be used. Um, so instead, I tried an affirmation statement uh, to try and head off any last minute choice to be dishonest, uh, where a student might be tempted to look something up online or share an answer with a friend. Um, so I gave them this statement. They had to agree to it to get into the exam. Um, and it may have had it may have had some effect. It, it may have um, headed off some dishonesty. It, ultimately, um, about two percent of the students in my class provided an answer on their exam that was obviously copy pasted from an online source. Um, and that's higher than ever. In, in person, um, it's, it's much less than 1%. Sometimes I would find 
two students out of 400, um, right? So that's half a percent. So a factor of four higher roughly. Thankfully, the UB Office of Academic Integrity um, has a clear roadmap for how to address, consult, um, and resolve instances of academic dishonesty. Um, the key is a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the student. It's very time consuming, um, but nearly 100% of the students showed up to this meeting. You know, it's a 15 minute meeting, but multiply that by however many students you have to do it with. Um, and the students took this meeting very seriously. Some of the students denied the offense, um, even though there isn't really a case for plausible deniability, they tried anyway. Um, while other students accepted it, admitted to the offense um, and apologized and seemed to grow from the experience. So there's real value there um, in enforcing the academic integrity. And that takes me to my final point um, and one that Flower addressed comprehensively this morning, empathy and connection. What did the students need from us faculty during the pandemic? I think that the needs weren't especially unique in 2020. Um, they were just magnified. Our students, they're age 18 through their early 20s and beyond. And they were still faced with the same growing up challenges as always. And now there are major health and economic crises on top of them. So in my introductory class, I saw this in office hours. I saw a few students regularly. Sometimes they'd come to talk about the course, but sometimes these students would just come to chat and share that they read an article in a different class uh, about climate change. Um, so that was cool. Um, but most of the learning that I did about students um, were the students who didn't come to office hours, but the students that I had to talk to because they had violated academic integrity. Um, so I would have these 15 minute meetings uh, and I would find the stress, the students were stressed, taxed, um, and sometimes barely holding it together. Um, but I like to think that the 15 minute conversation with me, where I basically just listened, uh, provided, you know, some grounding for them. So that, that was spring, right? That was really tough. Everything was up in the air. Um, by fall, in my upper level class, um, all I noticed really that the use of office hours was higher than normal. Office hours was the main channel where I would communicate one-on-one -on -one on, with the students and they were always showing up. Um, and this is great, but there's always that balance to strike uh, where sometimes students will come and ask how to do something before they've really given it a try on their own. Uh, and this always is uh, something to deal with, but overall I found this understandable because People just needed more help this year. Um, so, so that's the end of what I've got to say. So I just reiterate uh, some of the main lessons that I learned um, in remote teaching this year. Um, I, I think I found that introductory students engaged best when they were graded. And if there wasn't a point attached to an activity, uh, they largely didn't do it uh, unless they were good students. Um, and in terms of collaborative work, I was really hopeful for it uh, as a way to bring my upper level class together. Um, but some of the students ended up being unhappy and opting out of it. Uh, and that was easy to accommodate in Blackboard. I kept doing group work, but I just started making groups of one uh, for those students who didn't want collaborative work. Um, and I faced real issues with academic integrity in my intro class. Um, I didn't face any issues in my upper level class. Um, violations went way up in the remote format, um, but there was a silver lining, which is that the one-on-one -on -one meeting with the offending students um, were sometimes, I would say maybe roughly half the time, uh, seemed to be productive uh, for their growth as a scholar, um, and they were always productive for creating face time between the student and me. Um, so yeah. Uh, like everything else, uh, it required more energy during the pandemic. Um, and this is the same for us faculty as it is for students uh, who are trying to learn, trying to choose a major, trying to do their thesis research, et cetera. Great, um, thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions that pop through the chat. Um, one question is you talked a lot about um, your learning goals, putting them up in front of the students and having them often. Can you give an example of a learning goal that you would present at the beginning of a lecture, for example? 
Oh yeah, totally. Um, so for 102 climate change, uh, they're extremely topical. Um, so students will be able to um, explain how carbon dioxide uh, uh, <laughs> heats the earth through infrared radiation, something like that. Um, and then, uh, right, and then that maps directly onto a test question that I'm going to ask them. So it's a really clear measurable, if by the end of the day, you're gonna know how to do this sort of thing. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had a question, you, you mentioned that you, you work in both UB Learns and Top Hat. Um, how students, did you have any pushback or did students struggle with moving, you, working in two different platforms? Yeah, they absolutely did. Um, and uh, they did. Uh, were I to teach my large class in an exclusively online environment, I wouldn't use TopPad. Um, I, I only used it because of the like instant answer function that is useful in the large lecture hall. Uh, but uh, yeah, having uh, having two places where they had to go, and even three if you count Panopto, because you know it's inside UB Learns, but it's also sort of its own separate thing. Um, yeah, they did struggle with that. So um, Top Hat would be the one I would drop. Okay. Um, there are a few questions about the academic integrity, which, as we all know, is a very <laughs> difficult topic. Um, in addition to the affirmation statement. Um, this uh, person asked if you wondered if you considered including a brief video or going live for a few minutes so they actually see you and hear you as a person to reinforce that statement. That's a great idea. That never occurred to me and I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we're here and stick around for the next session, by the way, because we will be actively working to all together to help solve these problems that come up and give each other good ideas. So stick around for the next the next part of what we're doing. Um, so there's one more question regarding those academic integrity meetings. Um, do you uh, record those meetings in case it needs to escalate to a formal academic grievance? Um, how do you handle that? Um, I have almost never recorded them. Uh, there was one meeting where it was clear from email beforehand that the student was combative and there were parents involved. It was an ugly one. Um, but aside from one that had red flags all over it, um, I didn't record anything. And I think that that makes the students um, feel more at ease. Uh, I mean, I took copious notes, uh, <laughs> but that's a little different from this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> All right, great. Um, if we don't have any more questions, we are almost exactly on time, which I'm very impressed by. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much to um, Dr. Poinar for the presentation. It was really wonderful.